This video is sponsored by Xseed Games, an opportunity I was happy to accept as I've been intrigued by the original Akiba's trip since May of 2011 when I was just starting post-secondary school and it was a Japan-only exclusive for my then daily driver console, the PSP. It will surprise no one who's seen more than one of my videos to learn that I was something of a weeb back then to put it mildly, obsessed with one day visiting the land of games and anime, which, despite still being a touch out of touch with reality at that age, I knew wasn't true of all or even most of Japan. But I also knew that the electric town of Akihabara was haven and heaven alike for geeky outcasts like me. And while it would be years before I had the disposable income and free time to see it in person, here, now, uh, there, then, was a game promising to make it my otaku role-playing playground. Albeit a playground overrun by vampires in disguise who drain their victims of not just blood, but their very will to leave the house, turning the promising future leaders of Japan into hopeless hikikomori. And it's up to our otaku hero, Nanashi, who gains super strength and a sunlight allergy after a fanged cutie named Rui turns him to save his life to expose those hidden monsters. Literally, by tearing all their clothes off so the sun will turn them to dust. That's the core combat mechanic, which does read as a flimsy excuse for fan service, but mostly ends up fueling the game's goofy sense of humor, as the low-poly character models were more retro-cute than sexy, even back then, and the game is equal opportunity with its stripping mechanics. Of course, as a vampire himself, Nanashi's gotta worry about the same thing happening to him, meaning he'll need to equip more and more durable clothing as the game goes on, which he can acquire by way of that core combat mechanic. In other words, this is a game where you run around Akihabara stealing people's ridiculous cosplay so you can put it on yourself. Suffice it to say, 2011 Jeff could not wait to play Akiba's Trip. Sadly, the PSP's relevance was waning fast that year, leaving even big franchises like Final Fantasy and Metal Gear struggling to secure stateside sales. So, a dialogue-heavy sandbox street-stripping simulator about an undead dork tearing the clothes off secret vampires in Tokyo's nerdiest neighborhood stood little to no chance of getting localized. And while the 2014 English release of the Vita sequel, Akiba's Trip Undead and Undressed, did briefly raise hopes that an HD port of the original might make it over here, that didn't materialize either. Until now. In celebration of its 10th anniversary, Akiba's Trip Hellbound and Debriefed, ah, HD, I just got that finally tells in full English the original tale of the Akiba Freedom Fighters and their battle against the sinister, shut-in creating Shadow Souls, with every spoken line both dubbed by a talented cast of English actors and available in the original Japanese, if you prefer. Which you probably do if you're interested in this game at all, but it's really nice to have the English option on top of that. And though Yazzie and I have been lucky enough to see the real Akiba Strip in person twice since this game first caught my eye a decade ago, and we'll be going back as soon as we can, the appeal of its sandbox setting hasn't diminished for me one bit. Because, though the electric town of today is just a short 16-hour flight away, the Akiba I glimpsed in Steins Gate and Oremo is forever beyond my reach now. Lost to time. Yet it still exists here, inside this game, thanks to the painstaking efforts that its developers acquire took back in 2011 to recreate the street layouts, businesses, big chains and mom and pop shops alike, and general atmosphere of the otaku mecha of their day as accurately as the PSP hardware and the magic of parody branding would allow turning this whole Yakuza-esque sandbox into an interactive Akiba time capsule. In much the same way those games offer to take their players back to various eras in the history of the Kabukicho Red Light District. 
Though perhaps it would be more accurate to call this Way of the Samurai ask. A choir has been doing the whole dense small town sandbox thing even longer than Ryu Gagotoku after all, and doing it their own way with branching story paths and tons of meaningful dialogue choices, including joke options that can end your game in the opening cutscene if you push your otaku perviness too hard. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. In any given conversation, you can be a nice, earnest dork, a cringy otaku LARPing the hero, or just a self-centered pervy asshole, which can change the trajectory of many events and eventually lead you to one of multiple endings, each with its own final boss. All these story options feed into an overall design philosophy that's a bit more simulational than early Yakuza. Each NPC in Akiba's trip wears two to three pieces of collectible clothing from a catalog of over 300, all of which can be stripped in combat. This means every NPC is also capable of fighting, and thus subject to all of the game's different enemy aggro states. Plus, they all have their own behavior loops. Charity workers will ask for donations, maids will hand out flyers for their cafes, art scammers will try to lure unsuspecting rubes back to their shady galleries, and otaku will run around snapping pictures of all of those things. All of which can lead emergently to these characters interacting with either the player or each each other. They can also fight each other, which will often happen as you're fighting in groups as friendly fire is turned on and attack arcs tend to swing pretty wide, and since humans and shadow souls alike fight using the same strip foo techniques as you, the resulting increasingly naked chaos is always fun to watch unfold. Add to that a factional reputation system that dynamically alters those AI behaviors, and you've got a game world that feels surprisingly alive and reactive, especially for a 2011 PSP title. With enough going on under the hood to make a Nintendo Switch sweat a bit when too many NPCs are on screen at once. PC and PS4 do run a lot better, so much so in fact that they even let you increase the number of pedestrians walking around the city if you want to raise the spawn rates for rare stuff, but personally I'm happy to put up with the Switch performance, at least until the Steam Deck's out, as this is a game built to be held in the hands and left close at hand, in a pocket perhaps, between sessions. A pick-up-and-play type action RPG for Tokyo folk too busy working and commuting to go geek out in the actual Akihabara. To anyone who took their sandboxes to go on PSP, 3DS, or Vita, its gameplay rhythms will feel instantly familiar and comfortable, if a bit archaic. So too will the graphics. Part of this is definitely nostalgia talking, but there's something eminently charming about that PSP aesthetic. The poly counts and UMD compressed textures weren't much bigger than what you'd see on PS1, but those textures actually stayed where the developers put them instead of wobbling all over the place, and the more advanced animation, lighting, and rendering effects the system was capable of meant properly optimized games could look comparable to contemporary console releases, especially on the original hardware's low-res, high-contrast screen. On an HDTV, or even the 720p Switch, the seams show a little… okay, a, a lot more clearly. I can see people taking issue with the developer's choice not to update the game's models or even its textures at all, but personally, as someone who wanted and never got to play it, I'm glad to have the game in its original form now, or as close to it as one could reasonably expect, as the visual novel character portraits, at least, are much crisper and less pixelated, as are the game's shaders and shadows. It is so cool being able to look a bit too closely at all the little hacks and tricks the developers used to stay under their poly budget while building these areas. To see where the 3D street ends and the skybox begins, count the pixels on the colorful squares that suggest posters, vending machines, and magazine covers on store racks, and watch the boxy buses not roll by on their obviously painted on wheels. And cooler still, when you pull back and use your vampire-detecting smartphone camera to take in the full scenes all these lo-fi assets combine to create, it still works. 
the buildings looming large on all sides adorned with anime iconography and nerdy brand logos, the open shops and stalls with their colorful displays and mountains of merch spilling into the street, attempting to lure you in off it with signs above pointing to further fun on the upper floors, the unmistakable green mesh that surrounds buildings under renovation, and the equally iconic red of Seika's landmark arcades, the oppressive afternoon sun beating down on Main Street. This is Akihabara. As is the case with a lot of PSP titles, sound design pulls a lot of the weight here. From the chatter of traffic and distant chiming of crosswalks you hear walking down Main Street, to the faint, muffled cheers of Moe, Moe, Q that greet you through the thin walls of back alley maid cafes, every place has its own authentic oral atmosphere that will sound familiar to anyone who's taken their own Akiba trip. But the graphics contribute greatly to the atmosphere, too. This is stellar low-poly art direction that does a lot with relatively little and, for me, only enhances that feeling of stepping back in time. Is it possible to feel nostalgic for a time and place you've never been to? For a game you never got to play? I'm definitely feeling that here. If you didn't grow up on graphics like this, you'll probably have to acquire a taste for them, but for anyone who has that taste, Akiba's trip, Hellbound and Debrief, is cozy as hell. Fair warning, though, even if you did grow up on PSP games, you may have a harder time finding a taste for the combat system in this one, which is as clunky as the graphics are chunky. You can tell immediately that this was built for a platform without a second analog stick, and because it uses all four face buttons for three different attack heights plus jumping, while the triggers handle blocking and healing, it lacks a player-controlled walk-on option or any of the other quality-of-life features commonly used to work around that. Instead, the camera automatically tries to find a side-on, fighting gamey view of you and whoever you last hit, which does work in one-on-one -on -one encounters, but if you're fighting a group, baiting them into hitting each other so you can focus them down one at a time is a very valid and sometimes necessary tactic, at least until you unlock some AoE moves or find a fast weapon with good range. Pro tip for that. If you buy French bread, which can be found at any convenience store or Kotobukiya for some reason, and give it to one of the free spirits lying around in the back alleys, they'll give it back to you as moldy bread the next time you see them, which, at 32 attack, is the best one-hand weapon in the early game. With a bit of luck, you can also grab a two-hand Echi Dojin from the UFO catcher near the station at the start of the game that hits hard enough to hold you over until that bread has ripened. Like the real Akihabara, this virtual town is full of secrets and hidden treasures like that, just waiting for those with the know-how and dedication to find them. There is depth to be found in the actual battle mechanics beyond just adjusting your stats, with the ability to target certain body parts tied to a dodge counter system that rewards you for predicting your enemy's aim. And stringing together a long chain of strips always feels immensely satisfying, but the sequel does refine all that immensely, and ultimately the best I can say about this is it's a functional 3D beat-em-up for its time with a fun gimmick. The preservationist in me absolutely loves that I can play the game as it was originally designed, but the part of me that was drawn to gamer difficulty does kinda wish they'd use the extra buttons and stick to maybe add Z-targeting or something. Still, it's not that hard to get used to. There are plenty of ways to boost your stats if you're having trouble, and thankfully, given the type of sandbox it is, Akiba's trip has a lot to offer beyond its combat system. Main and side content designed to provide a variety of productive things to do at all times, no matter how much time you have when you pick it up to play. Only got a few spare minutes? Enjoy a simple minigame or two at the Maid Cafe, then get some yen by trading your Maid Point winnings to the math-challenged yet deep-pocketed otaku outside. Got a bit more time? Go knock out one of the simpler side quests, hit up the local game studio and playtest their surprisingly meaty shmup, or hunt for some rare clothes and weapons so you can run around as a cat maid, clobbering nerds with your dakimakura. Or you could head home and bribe your little sister to act like she doesn't hate you, or act like she does, or try on any of the clothing that you've collected. 
guess no one told Nanashi about Rule D. Actually, if you put clothes on her and then have her insult you, it'll boost their durability, so this might be one of those times to say screw the rules, at least if you have money. Sis won't give you more than a mean look for less than a hundred bucks. If you're staring down a longer commute, or if you're already at home relaxing, the main story is always waiting for you, of course, which might involve fighting, but could just as easily mean picking up some lotion, rope, and a massager for the cougar who teaches you your stripping techniques, or listening to your 2D addict friend Nobu rant at length with the specificity of one of my videos about his favorite Magical Girl anime, teaching you all the lore behind its messy production and the weird indie manga that inspired it so that you can take on the quiz at the local maid cafe. Or you could simply sit back and watch from an informed yet detached position as other opinionated otaku yell at each other about it on Pitter. And it's in these moments that we see where the real heart of Akiba's trip, Hellbound and Debriefed, lies, in how it seeks to capture not just the look and geography of Akihabara as a place, but the distinct subcultures that define it as a community, and the ways, both friendly and hostile, those subcultures interact. Or, to be more precise, it captures what defined Akiba back then. Hence why, released as it was at the height of Ore Mania, there absolutely had to be some kind of tsundere emoto content here. It wouldn't be a true 2011 otaku simulator without it. Or without the weird sisterless pervert who pays you to tell him what it tastes like when she punches you in the face. There's also the indie idols who will verbally abuse you, being mean is part of their brand, as you snap pics for an older, working nerd whose actual waifu is fed up with all the time he spends at concerts, and of course the blonde weebs you'll hear shouting gibberish that once you acquire a foreign language dictionary translates to, Is anyone else here in otaku? And does this game work on my system? Which probably would have been me had my dream of visiting this city come true back then, so it's hard not to feel a bit roasted reading that, but Akiba's trip strikes a good balance between satirizing and celebrating all the different kinds of people who gather together on Akiba Strip. You'll see that the clearest in the Akiba Freedom Fighters, your ragtag group of friends who all have wildly different interests and values and get on each other's cases for it frequently, yet share a deep love for their town and the desire to protect it and all the different outcasts who call it home. Though who and what exactly that entails is a little open to interpretation. In case the fact that the main waifu on the box is a vampire didn't give it away, or the fact that Nairo, the vampire hunting government agency that recruits you, kills you immediately if you don't comply with them, the game's morality isn't cut quite as clear as it may first appear, and even as the game itself is working to preserve the Akiba of the past, it will task you with deciding what the city's future ought to look like. How compelling these questions will be to you, not to mention how much fun you'll have with the humor, will likely come down to how well you know both Japanese and otaku culture, and how great your capacity is for enjoying stupidly earnest, etchy action comedy anime from the late 2000s. As an aficionado of all three things, not to mention, again, all the PSP stuff I spent half this video gushing over, I totally adore it, warts and all. And if you can recognize and appreciate it for the product of its time and platform that it is, you may find that you do too. Now that I've said my piece about the game, it's time to take a look at what's inside this very nice 10th Anniversary Edition box. I apologize in advance to my fellow otaku for not having prepared a display copy and backup copy before performing this dangerous feat. First, we begin by removing the shrink wrap. Careful. There we go. It's off. Personally, I really like the N64 style form factor this thing has going on. Not just because I'm nostalgic for that, but because, I mean, just look at this cover art. It's gorgeous. On the back, you've got a bunch of screenshots as well as everything that's inside the box. And on that note, this box doesn't open up like an N64 box. It's got a convenient little flap that reveals the 10 years of Akiba memories 
art book. If you're a fan of this franchise, then you are absolutely going to want to pick this up, because not only does it contain a bunch of concept art and character profiles from this game, it also has a whole section dedicated to Akiba's Trip 2, with its own character profiles and some very nice concept art. Also nice to have is the actual video game that you can play in your game console. I really appreciate that they included that. And this two-disc Akiba's Trip soundtrack CD, which has on its front some really nice art of Dirty Bloody Princesses, the in-game idol group, and on its back you'll see a list of songs from that idol group, as well as other artists, and the full in-game OST. This game's got some great music in it, especially the shop theme. I love listening to its beats and its funky, funky rhymes, so this is really nice to have as well. All told, it has everything you'd expect to see in a lower price collector's set, and it all fits together in a box that looks great on your shelf. So if you're interested in picking one up for yourself, click the link in the doobly-doo today. Now lastly, I want to thank Xseed for sponsoring this video because I had a ton of fun making it and playing Akiba's Trip, and I hope you guys have a ton of fun playing it too. I'm Jeff Thu, professional shitbag, signing out from my mother's basement.